satisfied to web Ellis uh, trophy does that do you do you give yourself license to kind of you know visualize things or conjure up ideas of what you'd be doing you know potentially during the World Cup yeah I do um, a little a little bit I think uh, in two thousand a couple of years ago I don't know what year it was when we I won the league with Scarlets and I I think when you get close to it in terms of we had a semi final and we got to the final and you start to when it's within touching distance, I would think a bit, a bit more about it. You know, for me, it's personally having not been selected for 2015. For me, the goal of of getting there and to and to be part of it again is kind of what I'm thinking about most, especially after the year I had with my injury. Yeah, your injury. I mean, it must. Be, it was difficult. It was. Difficult. I mean, you made your Edinburgh debut in in March. Um, yeah. So a lot of long, long, long time on the sort of sidelines, looking at the team going. Um, uh, both Scotland and Edinburgh. Um, I mean, is it difficult looking at Scotland and having a sort of slightly up and down Six Nations? Um, do you, do you, you know, do you, is, is there an itch to get back out there? Oh yeah, the itch is there. Uh, I was lucky to be involved with uh, doing some sort of stuff for BBC during it to sort of stay, stay involved a little bit. But yeah, well, I think as a, as a as I was a captain and to, and to watch the games when they didn't perform as they wanted to, I, f I, f I feel the frustration and disappointment of the players. I know a lot of them, I've known them for years. I've known Greg Laidlaw since I was you know, 16. We've played together for 16 years. So it's, yeah, I felt their disappointment. And I know, because I know how much effort goes into it. I know how that feels to, to not win and how it feels to not perform. Um, but then I was lucky, I was at Twickenham to watch you know, like that sort of mad game at the end of the championship. And you, equally, you don't feel that elation because um, you're not part of it and that's kind of the thing I'm, I probably miss most is that feeling of elation and being part of being part of that team. Is there danger in taking that second half and picking them and obviously you want to take the positives out of it but there's a, is there a danger of going you know it probably wasn't necessarily the most satisfying tour, tournament from as far as yeah. perspective and going well, well we had a massive second half and then kind of wanting to carry that momentum on through um, is there a kind of balance to be had between taking the goods from it and then going well no we have to get better yeah I, th I think so I think um, if the sort of uh, if we had been steamrolled <laughs> in that second half to come into camp that would have been a really sour taste in the mouth for the guys and to, to leave it on that note before we meet up and I think for coaching and players like it wouldn't be great to, to show that I guess character or spirit whatever you want to call it um, to fight back against you know that was mental that game to come back and score 38 points it was just crazy so to me it showed glimpses of what we can do that was you know with the ball but for me we've known I think for a couple of years now that Scotland with the ball are are dangerous. You know, we've scored tries against the best teams in the world. We've scored a lot of tries. Um, we probably weren't as potent as we need to be in Six Nations. We had a lot of ball, didn't convert necessarily pressure to points. And you look at the Wales game that happened, you know, four, three, four disallowed tries over the line. Um, so for me, yeah, there's a lot of encouraging stuff from that game, but also the, the kind of, you know, a few alarm bell, bells going off in terms of how do we concede 31 points in a half of rugby. When you're looking and you're watching Scotland, are you looking particularly in the back row unit and kind of watching Hamish uh, and Ryan Wilson and, and Ehal? Are, are you kind of going, are you visualising playing within that unit or is it very much the way squad, 23 man squad, is it even a case of kind of, um, you know, wanting to get back just to literally be playing alongside? Um, probably a bit of both. You know, I know, Ham I know Hamish and Ryan well, we've kind of played a lot together over the last couple of years but then I you know I watch of course I watch the back row I watch how the guys are you know playing especially the guys playing your position you want to know how they're getting on um, I thought Magnus and Magnus Bradbury and Jamie went really well in the Six Nations so it's a bit more depth there you know I'm sure the competition will be fierce and Gregor has spoken a bit about you know the, the training squad and there was tough selections who, who missed out so look, those guys uh, I've not played for Scotland for over a year now so those guys are for me are probably in the driving seat is for me to you know try and come back make an impression in camp make an impression in the warm-up games uh, to get on that plane to Japan yeah I mean with Scarlet's you're, you're when well, you were coming in from obviously regional rugby outside of Scotland and um, so you, you were a little bit at a distance obviously you were coming back in from Scotland camps and stuff um, does that kind of um, did, did that make you feel slightly more on the outside as opposed to being involved in like uh, with either Glasgow or Edinburgh, obviously Edinburgh. Yeah, um, I, I kind of like that element of being outside, you know, for me, you know, from a playing point of view, it was the best decision I made was to, you know, to go and play and well, I loved, I loved being there and I was definitely a case of the right place at the right time to, from where we started to, to where we left in terms of the winning league and semi-finals of Europe and runners-up in the league the following year, so I learned a lot, but yeah, it's, it's definitely 
pluses and, and the sort of negatives to, to, to being away from home. Um, you know, I certainly miss playing in Wales, but I learned, I learned a lot. And now it's great to be, to be back under the sort of umbrella of the, of the Scottish rugby and, and trying to be part of the Scottish team. Did you feel you played your best for free of your career so far at the Scarlets? Yeah, 100%. In particular, my, you know, my, probably my third and fourth years was probably the best I've ever played. So, it kind of coincided with getting back in the Scotland team, um, and you know, coincided with my best, genuinely my, like my best rugby memories of that season, um, winning the league, um, and yeah, being part of something, being part of a real. You know, I think you look back, a real talented group of players all together at the right time. And since then, a lot of players have moved on. You know, Liam Williams to Saris and Scott Williams have moved on, and. A lot of guys have gone separate ways. Tyg Burns over here now, um, but yeah, we had a really good squad that kind of just came together. Was that difficult watching Scarlets having quite a quite a kind of dodgy season this season? Yeah, well, you know, it was. I, I still I'm close to like I still speak to them, um, and obviously the stuff going on with regional rugby was, you know, I found that quite hard and quite disappointing to to watch. And I, you know, I imagine I was like, if, if I'd been part of that, I would have been a lot of stress for players to to bear the brunt of. Um, so yeah, I feel for them. You know, they're obviously competition now, but you know, you feel for you feel for your teammates because again, like I said about the Scots, you know, you know how much effort goes into, it, you know how much energy, emotionally, physically, all goes into trying to create a winning team. And certainly with the success Scarlett's had over the last couple of years, to drop off that this year, they'll be they'll, they'll be pretty gutted about that. Um, you were one of the original Killer Bees. There's still, there's still um, two of you left. I think uh, John Bede is still playing down there. Johnny's still playing in Bayonne. Yeah, do you, do you guys, I mean, that was kind of... We have our annual conference, yes. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we still speak. Uh, I speak to Kelly quite regularly. Obviously, he's on the other side of the sort of the game now coaching, but I speak to Johnny still. Um, yeah, two of my good friends. Yeah, uh, obviously, with your injury this year, uh, and you were working with the BBC, um, Needless to say, you're 32. You're pretty much 15 years as a professional. Do you do you start to kind of look look beyond rugby and kind of go oh, yeah. well, maybe media, maybe this, that, the other, and in terms of business, business wise, is that yeah. something now your head is, has to be at? I, I think if you don't, you're stupid. I think you're an idiot if you don't plan. I've seen uh, a lot of people struggle when they stop. Uh, so for me, the, the injury was an opportunity to to spend a bit of time away from rugby and, and get some experience, find out what I wanted to do after rugby and. It was, it was actually really invaluable for me and I think for me the, there's not enough done for, for players to help them with that transition. I think it's, you know, like I said, that's all I've ever done in rugby. I've done 15 years with my mates playing rugby, effectively not really ever having worked a day in my life. And now I've got to, you know, when you stop, whenever that day may be, I think you've got to be prepared and you've got to put a bit of time and thought and energy and I think we need to be doing more to help guys, especially, you know, as mental health is such a... So, uh, so much spoken about it these days. I think for me, you see a lot of people struggle with that side of the game when they stop playing. Uh, for me, which is unacceptable. Is that because your value as a person for 15 years has been like what you've done on a rugby pitch? You take that away um, and then you're left to go, well, who am I? Is yeah, I, I heard people talking about it before, actually. It's interesting you say that. And I kind of didn't understand it, but now like, I see like your whole, your whole being has been, this is your identity as a rugby player. Oh, you just jump out he's a rugby player or whoever it may be and I think you you go from spending all day every day with your mates to potentially you know if you're doing business whatever it may be you left your own devices to figure it, figure it all out so um, I think it is quite a scary proposition for a rugby player to when that time comes and that's why I think we need to I think rugby players it's, it's more and more happy now you know help each other with it and um, try and make plans for what you're going to do and start planning much earlier than you, than you think you need to be. Not because you think it's going to end, but because it, it can end at any point. You know, there's, there's every chance I could have not come back from rupturing my kid. That, that's, that's the reality of sport. Some people don't come back from that. So for me, you've got to make plans. You've got to have other interests outside of the sport. Because I think that not only does it help you after rugby, I think it, it makes you a better rugby player as well, having that bit of balance to your life. Looking ahead to Japan, have you been to Japan before? Uh, yeah. And so, is it something you're looking forward to getting back in? It, it, just completely away from rugby. Yeah. Is it? it, it I presume this is an, it, it's yeah, bonkers. Uh, it's mad. Yeah. We, uh, I grew up in the in the Middle East, so I grew up in Hong Kong and uh, Malaysia, Shanghai. So I kind of knew a little bit what to expect in terms of the culture. So it wasn't as big a shock as some of the guys found. Uh, um, but yeah, I love, uh, yeah, it's. It's a real eye opener, even for me going over there. When I went over there in 2016 with Scotland, it's yeah, it's uh, it's something quite different. So, for, but that's for me. I love touring. I love, 
I love going over to places and learning a bit more about them. And you know, I, I'm big into my food and all that sort of stuff. So I love going and trying different things and exploring. So yeah, the rugby is going to be the focus. But I love, I love the sort of uh, proposition of going and touring around the place. Um, in terms of your se the seasons now, that the Pro 14 seasons now effectively over, do you, uh, in terms of when you're looking ahead to the World Cup in terms of the pool stages, are, in, in your head, do you naturally start mapping out each match and where you want to end up? Needless to say, when you go to a rugby tournament, you want to win every match. So yeah. the presumption is you want to win the World Cup and that's yeah. the game. But of course, internally, there is always expectations around what would be deemed a successful World Cup for mm -hmm. Scotland. Um, what is that expectation? I think you've probably hit the nail on the head there, to be honest, in terms of... Um, you say you want to win every game, so then if you say that, there is a presumption that you you want to win the World Cup. So, so I, I don't, beyond our first game, I don't actually know what the order of matches is. For me, that our focus will be, first of all, getting on the plane and two, beating Ireland. Uh, I've been to two World Cups and they've not had the, sort of the greatest memories for me personally. So for me, I, I want to get there and I want to, I know how hard it is to, to come out your group, you know, let alone push on into, into the further stage. And I know that's kind of the, the boring answer, but it's, it's the reality is that we, we were in New Zealand and we played in, you know, four matches. We played in, in Gales, effectively, and we won two, lost two, and we went we went home pretty gutted after four weeks. So I don't want that to happen again. You watch teams like um, England, Saracens, Saracens against Lancer, England against Ireland during the Six Nations. Um, you've got Ireland coming up. Do you naturally kind of go, well, there's a blueprint to be Ireland, or is that just? slightly too simplistic. I mean, every team looks to physically dominate the other. Yeah, I think I think that's a bit, a little bit too simplistic, and uh, certainly the, the way rugby is each game is very different. So, um, but yeah, look, we know the guys very well domestically. Um, you know, we know enough about them internationally. But I said to some of the press guys before, it's, you know, knowing things, knowing what they're going to do, and, and stopping is two very different things. So. You know, the coach has had a long time to, to plan. Uh, we've not really broken into like in terms of how we're going to approach these games, but you know there'll be clear strategies uh, to go into the Ireland game and win it. Looking at the, the SNC side of things, coming back from the Achilles, have you done speed testing, and is that something that, or is, is it just a case of getting back on the pitch? Or no, yeah, I, I I ran I ran quicker than I've run in sort of six years with it. Uh, it's come back uh, stronger than it was before, so. For me, the process was a bit longer than I would obviously would have liked, but it, it allowed me to do a lot of training, a lot of things that you can't really do week in, week out in rugby when you're just putting out fires, you're just getting ready for the next game. So in terms of my Achilles now, it's better because I had tendonitis, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, as a rugby player, you're always, I think you're always injured at some point. I am certainly. So it's kind of a case of, you know, my body feels great now. Did you lose or gain weight with the Achilles? I put, yeah, I put on weight. So I wanted to, get, again, gave me a chance to put on a bit of muscle mass look after my you know, shoulders, you know, get a bit of muscle back on my body. Because when you're playing, I'm one of those players that, you know, if I play a couple of games, your body's completely you know, beat up, then you've got to try and do weights. And you're like, well, I can't do weights. So you, your body weight drops off. And I think that's probably the story for a lot of, a lot of guys. When you're in your 30s, I'm guessing you're, you're kind of looking at um, Paul Conn previously spoke about, you know, he knows when to say, I'm not doing that training. Or, yeah. Uh, are, you, are you at that point where you're kind of looking after yourself and playing a bit smarter? I try to, yeah. <laughs> you get a bit of abuse for it. But it's normally from the young guys. Yeah, I think like, I think I'm thirty. I know how to prepare for a game now. I'm, I'm, you know, I know how to be ready for the weekend. Um, that said, you still have to do. You know, it's good to do it sometimes. But I think yeah, the most important thing, regardless, is that you perform at the weekend. I think you perform well. You can you can manage yourself a little bit. Um, and there is players. You know, certain guys, certain positions. You know, you get hammered and say, so, well, at what point do we start to? pull you back a little bit because compared to some guys the back row guys are getting taking a hammering yeah it, it, is it the shortest position in terms of career in terms of yeah most um, you had a little bit of a, a, a spat well, I don't know if you'd call it spat but um, uh, Glasgow put up a tweet this week <laughs> about, uh, uh, I see Ryan Wilson got back to you as well yeah <laughs> yeah well, would you like to let, yeah what, what, what was going on there ah, I thought it was just good fun I thought it was I didn't mind too. I thought it was I thought it was hilarious. I don't understand why I was taken down. So I think for me that's what kind of what social media is about is to take away the sort of sanitized version of where everything's controlled by everyone. And I think as long as it's not offensive, it was, you know it's, that's you know you can put the same beige you know vanilla stuff all the time. But to have something a bit more enlightening, a bit more fun, 
a bit of engagement with other players, I think that's where, where it's meant to be. Is social media is the type of thing that kind of get, gives PR guys kind of nightmares these days? Yeah, I think stuff so, like yeah. Stuff like the whole Falao stuff. And yeah. Well, that's obviously at the stream end yeah. of things. But even kind of just kind of yeah, you have to you have to be careful. But I think like it has got. I think the, for me, the whole point of social media was to give people insight into into individuals, into char characters, and I think it kind of got away from that a little bit. Uh, like I say, got a little bit sanitized. I think you know we're all individuals. You know, guys will be individuals, and, and guys have personalities, and people want to see that. Is it a generational thing? It seems like the professionals coming through, sort of guys in the early 20s now can be can be very kind of sanitised and it's sort of understandable because yeah. being in the media looking for you to say something well, interesting. It. Well yeah, you don't want to get caught out. No. You don't want to get caught out, but there's a big difference between having a bit of laugh and then doing something stupid and I think knowing where that line is and having a bit of fun with it is, is no bad thing. Um, final question, um, you spent your entire life in Pro 14, um, has there, is there an itch or is there any kind of, is there a desire maybe to finish up overseas or? Yeah, I looked. I looked on. I looked. Um, there's this sort of assumption that if you want to play somewhere, you just go and play there. But you know, there's a lot more to it in terms of a team needs to want you. Needs to, and, and I think there's a lot of guys who back row for me is one of the positions where there's so many good young players coming through. So yeah, I'd love to go and potentially play elsewhere. Um, but I'm also realistic about it has to be the right thing. You know, I've got a family and they'll come first always. So I'll, I'll do whatever's right for my family. But yeah, the prospect of you know, a season or two in France would be quite nice. There seems to be quite a long line of kind of Scottish international back rows. Uh, Ali Schrock, yeah. we were talking about earlier, yeah, yeah. going across to France. Um, um, so, yeah, I'm guessing you hear stories of back from France yeah. and the bad. Yeah, well, there's, that's the thing, there's good and bad. So, I think, ever again, it's kind of roasted in the specs where you go and live in France and you eat baguettes and croissants all day and drink red wine, but it's, it's not quite like, yeah, maybe you do that, but then a lot of the clubs you look at and they're, they seem a bit shambolic in terms of the, you, you hear, or you see media reports or, or disgruntlement, you know, of, of certain teams and you may have the biggest profile club in the world or whatever it might be, but are the guys enjoying it? So I want to enjoy my rugby, you know, definitely towards the end of my career, you know, I've only got X number of years left and wherever I am, I want to be happy. Thank you, John. Nice one. Cheers, man.